Hey everyone, uh, I'm Peter John Huyeman, back again. This time I'm going to be focusing on business people, on movers, on shakers, but specifically focusing on those Africans in South Africa who have made an impact on my life and broader South African society. I think it's an important conversation to have now. Tensions are high as we speak in South Africa. There's a lot of misinformation going on. And I believe we, we, we need to remind ourselves of the human, of the humane, and that not everything about foreigners in South Africa has been all doom and gloom and dark. I personally have benefited from a lot of Africans from all over the continent. Um, I, could, I could name the countries, Angola, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Libya, Nigeria, you name it, <laughs> you know, um, Ghana, just goes and it goes and it goes so today i've got with me a brother of mine uh, someone that i've met through a woman who's now my wife it is uh, davies oluwule okay. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i hope i've <laughs> said that well <laughs> no no it's quite complicated so it's i'm gonna give you my full name yes yeah. so davis damilola mm -hmm. oluwole mm -hmm. While we're even on the topic, Oluwale is my father's name. Okay. Ogunyemi was our son name okay. before, but Ogun, Ogun is an idol. Okay. We served in our family, in general, even in, in Nigeria. So Ogunyemi means you worthy of the idol. So when my dad became a Christian over time, he wanted us to, you know, stay away from me. I love the name, but that was his, he made that decision then. We had to make it a compound name, so the plan was eventually we st start using Oluwale. Mm -hmm. But I really like the complexity of my son name now that I probably would would keep it oh wow yeah so oh, that's wow. just uh, that's my intro uh -huh. so you you nigerian south african that's what i i've, I've seen written about you i'm a full nigerian, <laughs> full nigerian. Okay. i was born in nigeria okay. where nigeria I was born in Lagos. I, Lagos. You know, I gave you okay. yeah, most of the people, but I'm from Kogi State. Okay. Um, Kogi State is the central north of, of, of Nigeria. I got to go home, we used to go home until like 20, 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. That's when I stopped going back to Kogi State. So I lived most of my young life, um, young growing up, mostly in Lagos. Mm -hmm. in Lagos. And I moved in between spaces in Lagos as well, but I can't really call myself a Lagosian. Mm -hmm. Like most of my teenage years I spent mostly in in South Africa because okay. I moved here when I was 15. 15. Yeah, I, I finished high school back home then. For some reason, I couldn't get into varsity. I was about to go to a neighboring country. Um, what's it called again? It, to learn French. Okay. But then South Africa happened and my dad asked me to re relocate for the sake of university mm -hmm. and probably just continue my life here. Okay. Which maybe that's why you think I'm an Nigerian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, South Africa. <laughs> so since then I've, I've been here for almost nine to ten years now. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in Nigeria. So wow. I don't even really know how some places look anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of my culture has even changed. Oh, wow. So that's why a lot of people would think that because I've spent most of my time growing up here with mostly South Africans. Okay. Yeah. Interesting that you finished school at age 15. Can you tell me more about that? Because I've, I've met other Nigerian families and mm. they also seem to have, you know, when I talk to a guy and he's 16 and he's, he's you know, <laughs> about to head for his first year at varsity, then I sort of ask myself, Whoa. what's going on here, you know? <laughs> so what, what's up with that? Is it is it a thing in Nigeria? Is it's it, a thing, it's okay. a thing. I would, I would say how I got into that situation. So I was in grade four. Okay. When my dad came, because I'll say my mom, my, my dad is, is a polygamist. Okay. So my mom was separated. So before I moved in with my dad, <clears throat> I was with my mom. And I think I was nine. I was nine years old. Eight, nine when it came. You know, it came to see us. So he went then from there. Came to pick me up. We went to this other school. I was meant to write a test. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the test. I think I didn't even finish grade four. Oh, wow. I joined uh, grade seven in the midterm or, or something, <laughs> or oh, something wow. like that, which I didn't really appreciate from my dad because I needed to also grow. It's not just about your IQ and smart and all of that. Emotional intelligence is very, very key mm -hmm. for a person to develop. For wherever, even if you're a genius, mm -hmm. you need emotional intelligence in case you're going to make a lot of errors. So he came, he fetched us, I wrote, now the next Monday I'm being told I'm moving in with my dad, okay, which is a different change, mm -hmm. and I'm starting a new school, and I'm skipping three grades. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've always been a kid that adapt quickly. Yeah. Which is one skill I think I've always had. So when I got to the school, I wasn't really foreign. I catch up quick. Yeah. 
right so i was easy to catch up quick with with the curriculums <laughs> i think that's why he or my dad saw that which was why i think he also made the decision okay. he, he made so that's how i got into that then from i was grade seven nine and I knew what I wanted at any age. At the age of nine, I knew I wanted to be an accountant. Sure. I really, I was that kid that knew most of the things I want, and I was really precise. I was really good at a lot of things as well. I, I tried acting at church and day. I, I was very good at soccer. I was really good. Okay. That was what I actually really wanted. Okay. But because you know, parents make the decision. They wanted school, so I would, you know, I could juggle both. Mm -hmm. I could be good at soccer and be good at my school. Okay. As at that point, so I think that's what make him make that decision. Tell me, do you think um, South Africa and other African countries should maybe follow suit and allow people to to or get into the culture of their children starting school earlier and maybe finishing earlier? Is it a good thing in any way? Like I said, yeah. if there's a way we can develop the emotional intelligence okay. at the same time as the IQ, mm -hmm. it, it would be a great thing. Because okay. I mean, we've seen in China, mm -hmm. they found a way to do it in the US. They're mm -hmm. kids that, are, you know, they, 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 they team as genius, they, they grow. You can, when you have conversations with this kid, you can say this kid is matured. Yeah. And at the same time, they're good at their schoolwork. Okay. If we can find that balance, because the problem we mostly have is we're having a lot of people with good IQs, but that are not mature, and which is not good for our society. Because mm -hmm. we're just having, I call them intelligent, dumb people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very intelligent, but they don't know how to live life. They don't mm. know how to make certain decisions because they've been put in a corner where they just study the whole day. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not engaged in social activities mm -hmm. and other things to get to know who they are holistically. Sure, sure. Not just, you know, you know your books. Yeah. If you can find a way to honest your gift that you have in, in terms of your IQ and get to know yourself as a person outside of your books. Sure. And you combine that, mm -hmm. we'll have great people in the society. Okay. So, so, so take me to Varsity. Okay. Um, you went to university at University of Johannesburg yeah, in South Africa. Okay. Take us through that experience, what you studied, what, what mm. you went through there. So I, I did become accounting. Okay. Uh, my, then it was tough, it was tough because I mean, my, my parents were not rich. So I remember for my first year, I applied for VET in UP. I got into all three, but because of international student, I have to pay double. I was going to pay almost 60 grand in UP, then it was 100 grand in VET. So of course UJ by default was <laughs> was the option. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I was gonna pay thirty five. And I remember my dad was having financial difficulties then. Okay. A big one. And he's a polygamist and yeah. you know the money's not even enough already. Now How many siblings do you have, but that I know of? Yeah. I think eight or nine. Okay. I'm not too sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, for an international student to start, you need 30%. Firstly, I got to register late because of the money and everything. He actually told me he won that money in Monte Casino in uh, Empress Palace two okay. days before. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that, trust me, that was the only school fees I paid throughout my entire <laughs> my entire time. So I paid this 30%. You know, I studied hard. I won't lie. I, my first day, I studied really hard because I really wanted a buzzer. I applied for buzzer. We'll go for to cross night or apply buzzery after we study it's like crazy knowing fully well most buzzers are for south africans but i'll just apply either way yeah some will respond telling me oh sorry you're not south african everything and then if you haven't paid some amount uj doesn't give you access to your your result yeah so i finished first semester not knowing what my my result was and i finished first semester not knowing if i'm gonna come back for second year because i remember me i told my two best friends then i do it guys i'm gonna go get a job in shop right you know wow. work something and go to unisa and try you know make it work then i was in the bus i was in the mega bus one day and i got an sms i was invited for the first year top achievers okay. i didn't even know what that was oh. as at that point my, my other friend also got in I haven't seen my result. Okay, yeah, this sounds nice. <laughs> okay, so I went for this. I went for this event, and my mom, my guide, and my mom, the woman who became my mom, mm -hmm. is, a, is someone who took me in when okay. I went to church. When some, eh, so that's, I think that's a different interview or story for another, another day. Yeah, another, another day. day. Okay, because um, you know they took me in. Yeah. They didn't really. They met my parents once. Mm -hmm. And but I used to go to church after, and she just picked an interest in me, and she they took me in. I stayed with them when I did my matric, so I stay I was staying with them when I was well, when I was doing my university as well. So they're more like that's my mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So she she's she's a, she's a pastor now. Then she was just a worker in the church, and she told me it was UJ 10th anniversary, okay. right? And Standard Bank was giving out 10 buzzer, 10 student buzzer to whoever is part of the first year of Jesus regardless 
what country you're from, oh, wow. which is the weirdest part. And she told me she felt like that's for me. I'm thinking there's almost a thousand students that I don't even know what I got. I'm sure the people who even got it <laughs> better than me. Sure. That okay, man. You know what? But I'm gonna tap into the faith. And it was a rigorous process uh, to write an essay, which my one of my ex-girlfriend actually wrote that essay <laughs> for me. To enter the process, mm -hmm. and I got this buzzer. It was uh, they called it the Standard Bank Actuarist or something. There were ten people they gave, and I was the only foreigner oh, wow. in the group. Oh wow! Wow! Mm -hmm. And you know that also told me it was a very rigorous process. That maybe because. I knew I had to get it. I had to put on. I remember the day they called me. That was as I was having that similar talk with my friends. I we were in the elevator. I remember I tell them, guys, I might go work in shop right. <laughs> might be that and, bad and root. <laughs> don't you think being a so-called foreigner in in a different place? sort of you know puts you or kicks you into a different gear where Definitely. you know there's no mother or daddy to fall back mm. on there's there's mm. there's really nothing it's it's like you're saying it's right. either you make it or you've got to like start at the bottom again yeah, yeah, no, it definitely did because I mean, I'm from where, as at that point, I was becoming more responsible for myself. Yeah. Because my parents were not giving me money and all of that. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, I figured at, at that early age, at 18, 19, that I had to save myself. Mm -hmm. That no one is coming to save me. Sure. That I need to work hard, mm -hmm. you know, to get to where I'm going to. And I'm, I mustn't have all hate mm -hmm. towards anyone towards my parent towards the society there's not giving me an, an option so that really it, it put me taught me a lot it, mm -hmm. it really did and it definitely gave me more because i would wake up in the morning with that with that hunger that you know mm -hmm. i need to make something of, of, of myself so i got that call that <laughs> that day and they told me got the bursary i cried because oh, wow. it's like wow yeah. this is a turning point sure in my life and i figured that out it was a turning point and this buzzer was going to even pay for all the expenses of, that I, that, okay. <laughs> that i've incurred yeah. prior to that time so december was really good for me and second year was when i started becoming more of myself i always say something like you need some level of comfort mm -hmm. sometimes in life to find the, to become a better version of yourself and right now most of us are still fighting to get into that comfort mm. before we can even become mm -hmm. a better version of ourselves second year i started knowing who i was mm -hmm. i started not focusing on just schools i started coming up socially as well to know who am i except from the institution you know who am i in a social setting mm -hmm. Am I fake? Mm -hmm. Am I, you know, what, do, is this the same person as consistent? Sure. You know, do I involve, you know, do I adapt and all of that. So 2016, 2017 was really great. And my marks started going up. I think then I, third year I graduated cum laude. I only missed two distinctions <laughs> <laughs> in my congrats, entire, congrats. entire degree. And 2018, I did my honors in, in, in financial management, okay. which I also finished as a top student. That really baffled me because that course was really tough okay it was really tough and i think it also involved me to become who i am because i did my honors in financial management and what i noticed about the course i did was it was not only about just school work it was about decision making mm -hmm. which i think has helped me going forward in my career and whatever i did after that that i figured it out that the decision you make mm is really really important not only in business mm -hmm. but in your personal life mm -hmm. the kind of decision you make there's, there's going to be those moments that would really transition you into either going forward backwards or staying the same waiting for another opportunity sure but sure. like it's really key to know those moments and that course enlightened me about, about that because within that course someone told me to apply for my masters i never wanted to do my masters in my head i'm thinking 2018, I'm gonna go work for Standard Bank. Mm -hmm. Or I was a senior tutor then in UJ. I'm gonna become the academic clerk for then. I mean, I'm finishing the best student either way. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, the person told me to apply for the masters. I didn't want to. Yeah. Then one morning I woke up. I took a walk. I'm like, you know what? It's not gonna take anything from me. Yeah. Let me apply for this masters, and that decision is what made me legal in this country till April 2022. Hmm. The decision I made in 2018. Yeah. That really told me a lot because I didn't get the job in Silent Bank. Mm -hmm. I didn't become the academic clerk. Sure. And if I hadn't made that decision, I was going to be stranded. Yeah. I wasn't going to be legal. Yeah. So it's going to be now I'm fighting just to be legal. Mm -hmm. I'm not even fighting to go to the next stage mm -hmm. of, my, of yeah. my life. Yeah. And yeah. making that decision changed everything. That's why I can sit with you today and have this conversation. This conversation. Being that self-reflective person that you are, to maybe use a wider critique or look at society, mm. 
and I'm going to to change the topic a little bit. Okay. But prior to this, you spoke about forms of discrimination that you feel you experienced within even the university space. Is South Africa or are South Africans xenophobic in your or Afrophobic in your in your view? I never like to really generalize. Yeah. I like holding people accountable for their actions. Mm -hmm. I've seen South Africans that are xenophobic mm -hmm. and I've seen South Africans that are not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are a good example. Sure. But the general public hard because of the knowledge they have, mm. which is the key thing. It's, not, it's more of ignorance than deliberate sometimes because mm. they're being told that these other black people that are in your country are the source of your poverty. And I will react. If I'm also in that case and I don't have the knowledge that I have, I'm just a normal person, I'll definitely react because I feel like you're taking my food and it's human to want to act that way. I think the solution is to educate mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. not take jobs from foreigners to give to these people. Mm -hmm. Always, I told a friend, the job, the, the, the aim is to create jobs, right? Sure. So if I can create 20 jobs, mm -hmm. why don't I create 20 jobs? Does it matter where I'm from? Sure. Because in the US, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter where you're from. Mm -hmm. It's the value you bring. Sure. For whatever years they started, mm -hmm. they opened the ground for people to come in because mm -hmm. they saw they needed other people. Mm -hmm. And everyone was to is to create that synergy sure that okay you can create jobs oh our people need jobs okay all right come create jobs for these people come work that's the same mentality that's needed but here yeah, because it would, it would bounce so, with politics is no way i mean i mean okay i won't dwell on the topic yeah. right I've, I've gotten your viewpoint but what i would i would perhaps put forth as a proviso around this and it's a warning that I think uh, one academic put out before. Mm. You see, my experience of other African nationals might come from a very sort of middle class perspective. Because mm. when I lived in Cape Town, mm. I lived with a Libyan who has got his master's in civil engineering. Oh. I lived with a Congolese <laughs> guy who was doing his PhD in electrical engineering. Okay. A Nigerian who was at independent media. Another Nigerian who was doing his PhD in, in, in chemical engineering. Sure. <laughs> a guy from Cameroon doing his, um, well, he had a master's in chemical engineering and then he got an LLB. Oh, that's nice. So I lived with those people in Lansdowne in Cape Town. Mm. My experience is obviously different to what other South Africans are saying the experiences are. Mm. And it seems like it has a bit of a class element to it. It does, it does. So, with that said, should we not then maybe be more sensitive to what is actually happening in some of these areas? You know, um, because with the poverty you speak about, crime is rampant. Yeah. And we can't shut out what those people are saying. You cannot. And I believe that Operation Dudula, as controversial as it has Being. come to be, is someone standing up in the community and coming up with what they believe is a solution. But blanket condemnation of what he, of what Nshantla is doing mm. might actually exacerbate the situation. Mm. Where we, because of this awareness and knowledge and education you speak about, should be saying, can't we bring this young man into the fold of the collaborative work we are doing? And also with our activist mileage and political mileage, I'm speaking mm. from my side, advise him and say, how about building certain programs around what you are doing? Mm. to then then it's a different question because yeah. combating something is very easy because people will fight back people will fight back it's with the humans exactly so will fight back. exactly and then what perishes like they say you know the african saying goes elephants fight it's the grass that, that suffers that suffers underneath so I'm, I'm i'm happy to have you here thank you and i hope this gets the reach that it should Mm. because I want us to have more of these conversations. Mm. I have really materially benefited from other Africans being here. I've benefited, you know, I've uh, gotten context, I've gotten knowledge, at, I've... Uh, no, you, what you say makes sense. Let's look at America, let's look at Europe. Europe, before the, the Brexit thing, yeah. was accessible. They mm -hmm. were independent. Mm -hmm. Each country was independent, mm -hmm. but they created a network. Mm -hmm. Right, Africa can't really do that at this moment because each country is not an equal footing. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is share our skills mm -hmm. which we've not been doing we've been taking most of the skills needed 
to either Europe. Mm -hmm. During COVID, we had to go fetch doctors in Brazil, oh, wow. which was yeah. weird. Yeah. In Brazil, in Cuba, in Cuba. Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. You telling me those people are smarter than everyone in Africa? Is sure. that what you're telling me? Sure. You can see where there's no synergy between us. That way, we can go to for Nigeria, for example, to go get doctors to come in, mm -hmm. or South African doctors can go there. Mm -hmm. We need to create that that you know. The, we are the ones that are going to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have this mentality that either the government is coming to save us as a lame man mm -hmm. or Europeans one day will have mercy on us mm -hmm. and save us. Sure. They won't. It doesn't sure. work like that. Sure. We need to create like programs, mm -hmm. not act, not actively combating things, but looking for active solutions. Dialogue. That give us a WW, a win to win situation. Uh -huh. These people are in your country. Mm -hmm. People don't leave their country for leaving sake. For the trivial reason, reasons. People leave their country because it's not conducive mm -hmm. and the constraint in that country, they can't control it. Sure. I had to leave Nigeria because the constraint was too much. Mm -hmm. Everyone comes here with this with the with the mindset of getting a better life. Sure. Right. I mean, do we get the wrong people? Yes, I won't lie. There's a lot of Nigerians that do drugs, that do fraud. Is it good? No. Yeah. But the fact is, they shouldn't be treated as Nigerians doing drugs. They should be treated as a human being committing crime. Because mm -hmm. South Africans commit crimes too. Sure, sure. They commit crimes, they commit crimes in Nigeria as well. Sure. They commit crimes anyway. Mm. But this label is what needs to go. Because people need to be treated as an interviewer. You, as Davis, you, you sold drugs. Mm -hmm and you're going to jail. Mm. It doesn't matter where you're from. Sure. Once we can develop that mindset and see humanity before we see nationality, mm. it's gonna really, really change a lot of things. Because when me and you sit down and we don't talk, no accent, nothing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then someone who doesn't come sees us, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be able to easily identify you South African yeah. or you thinning. Mm -hmm. You know, until, but because of the divisions we've created as, as people, has created this and that's what we need to focus on on focusing on humans mm -hmm. and not nationality i think sure. on the long run it would decrease mm -hmm. it would i don't think xenophobic will ever go away because mm -hmm. humans are, we already have some of this knowledge. but the aim is now is to it should decrease it shouldn't be a norm it shouldn't be something that's always portrayed on the news at yeah. every yeah. at every point mm -hmm. you know and i think the best way is and this this is news as well this is yeah, this is part well, of this, media, media. The, the kind of thing that we are doing now um, in, in our conversation I had with you I did say that um, this is a medium mm. and the plural is media, media. but mm. I think that people view this as an institution that runs independently and that, <laughs> you know yes there's money thrown behind it but do you think that what we're doing now should be done more in that we are forming part of what's out there what is mm. going to be consumed mm, mm, mm. and it needs to definitely balance any narrative because any narrative that has an agenda about it is definitely about skewing things or making things look one way yeah whereas not giving us the panoramic view of sure. of, of life no I, I definitely agree with you i yeah. agree with you and you know you said something about dialogue. Mm -hmm. The Dudula operation didn't have any dialogue before the operation. Sure. You know, if there was a dialogue and the, the foreigners disagree, mm. and you can prove, okay, these people decide, okay, you know, you know what? I've had, I've tried to talk to you. Yeah. It didn't work out. Leave my country. Sure. That would make more sense. Sure. If we can use the media, mm -hmm. like you're saying, to to have those conversations, mm. we humans, we're gonna feed off each other mm -hmm. and find a way that okay, these people are here. How do we live? Peacefully, because mm -hmm. that's what is aimed. How do we get people to add value regardless where you're from? Mm -hmm. If you're a foreigner, you're South African, or whatever, what needs to be created at the end of the day is value. Because what we've noticed is values will create employment. Sure. Right now. Sure. Right now, we're having a big unemployment in this country that both foreigners and the national people are suffering. Sure. But the foreigners are being blamed for it. Regardless of all the politicians, things that are going on, of course. Regardless of all the injustice has also gone on sure. before. Sure. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you can't just tell foreigners to leave. It won't work. I don't think that's the answer. Sure. The answer would be is how can people create value? Mm -hmm. Regardless where you're from. That that's my own opinion. Sure. No, I, I appreciate that and, and I believe it starts with, so obviously 
there's a problem with our border system, right? There's problems in the in the South African police service. There are problems with God bless you. <laughs> God bless you for saying that. Look, there there are problems with home affairs. A big one. But 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 I believe you mentioned places like the USA. You mm. mentioned other countries. Those countries still want you to have a form of patriotism mm -hmm. going into that country. So I believe if we want to have genuine discussions, dialogue, yes, first of all is important, but we need to come together and say, what do we agree on? Mm, mm, mm. How do we bolster mm. the efforts of home affairs? How do we bolster the efforts well, of SAT? Just to catch, can I give a, 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 uh, just a, a visual representation of what happened in South African Embassy in Nigeria? Sure. There's no queue, you don't book appointment. People literally just go there mm -hmm. ne? and bribe, and you see 50 people raising up their hand, and the, the embassy guy is gonna come out and just pick someone, you come inside. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. People end up going, oh, it's only if you've paid, you get in. Mm -hmm. So if I can do drugs and I have a little bit of money, mm -hmm. that means I can pay the embassy guy to tell me to come inside yes. and get me a visa. Yes. The same thing you said about police. I was having a conversation with a friend that why are we acting like these people doing drugs are doing it in a country where there's no legal system? Mm -hmm. It's because the police have been bribed. And we've seen this. Go to Ebro. Mm. It happens right there. Mm. The police know of the drug dealers sure. and the drug dealers know of the police sure they have an arrangement mm. and that's why i say those are the kind of active things that need to be done mm -hmm. people need to be held accountable regardless the police has been involved and the foreigner that's doing the drugs they're both criminals sure. and they're the one causing the country the pain mm. and that should be addressed mm. Mm. not seeing all foreign numbers go sure no I, I like that you've taken that approach because that's exactly where i'm going i'm mm. going to the nuances they are bad cops there are also good cops in South Africa. And you know, who of us would want to be in that position? Your life is in danger every day. Police are getting killed every day. And perhaps there are many, many more things we need to change because as a black South African, you know, the institution called policing doesn't have very positive memory that it evokes. True. It was highly militarized in apartheid, mm. you know, used for torturing, it was brutal. You know, and you might find that even myself, born in 1995, I still sort of have that at the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. That no, 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 that, that institution is one I don't want to ever get close to. But the reality is that there are certain groups in this country who befriend the police, mm -hmm. who support them, mm -hmm. maybe buy them a little bit of lunch or, <laughs> you know, because it, it is really, it is a difficult job. Policing is not easy. With all the critique we have, we need to sit back and we need to say to ourselves that leaving your family, dressing and leaving your family and that maybe being your last day is, is not an easy thing to just overcome. You understand? So again, going back to your human question, it becomes, are the support services within SAPS really sufficient? Is there sufficient intervention on a regular basis? Psychological assistance? Mm. Are there chiropractors coming in? Are there masseuses coming in? Are there people who can come in and give proper spiritual guidance? Like you'd have chaplains, you know, um, in the military. And, you know, can people really come to terms with the traumas? They see horrible things on accident scenes. So sure, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I believe our president was wrong in his approach to Operation Dudula. He just came out and did a blanket criticism. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, and, and he's a guy who always sets up these task teams for everything, a task or committee for this, a committee for that. Feedback from. <laughs> <laughs> you understand, but now here was a chance to, to, to maybe revisit this. Yes, mm. it does sort of fall in the domain of South African police service and home affairs and the work that they're supposed to be doing correctly anyway. Mm. But if there is maybe an ad hoc group that looks at this kind of work. We could maybe turn this whole operation into something that's in fact, like you're saying, a value add. Yeah. Maybe there are young men in the township that can get into martial arts spaces and I agree. that teaches them discipline and how to positively use violence because violence isn't necessarily a bad but thing, thing. No, but control, think, control, it becomes a good thing. You're selling drug in my community. Uh -huh. it can, I can be friendly with you. Uh -huh. I can be friendly with you. <laughs> sure. to, to be sincere, it's a bad reputation for my country as well mm -hmm. to be associated. I'm always very, 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 very image conscious, conscious when I have to deal with a Nigerian mm -hmm. because of the reputation yeah. as well. I need to do an, an home, entire homework regarding you before I can associate with you sure. I don't want my image to be ta uh, tarnished. To be, to be tarnished. Yeah. And you know, it's important that they need to go, the drug dealers need to go. That's not a question. Mm -hmm. it, it, what he's doing is 
I don't fully support it, but I'm not fully against it because you destroy my country mm. to the point that, and he has every right to be pissed. Mm -hmm. It is his country, it's my own land, mm -hmm. and you destroying it mm -hmm. by selling drugs and everything. Sure. Which I agree, but the approach mm -hmm. was the problem. Mm -hmm. With this approach you're talking about, is way better because calling these people out, the police can't do it because they're already corrupt. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have a vested interest. Having a special force that deal with that mm -hmm. is really important deporting people back home mm -hmm. it's important because mm -hmm. you want to keep people of value in your country sure. that is of no dispute sure if you're doing any that's what i said if you're doing any crime mm -hmm. just make it worse if you're doing it in another person's yeah country it's the like, human I trafficking i live down your neighbor i yeah. come to your house and come <laughs> come and be stealing stuff like sure. come on sure you know sure. it's it's not any i don't think anyone in their sensible mind will support will support that mm -hmm. but at the same time approach really matters because it's political gray areas what Dula did could have caused an unrest between Nigerian as a country mm. and South Africa. Because yeah. it won't be on a, on a diplomatic level. On a level. diplomatic level, yeah. it won't be these people sell drugs that you're chasing mm. them. It's like you chase these people away mm. and you're manhandling them. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll be focused on. Sure. It won't be a case of the nuances. Yeah, they will. It won't, when you get to that point, it won't be about that anymore. Yeah. My experience as also as a foreigner in the formalized world, I'm not in the drug world, I'm mm -hmm. in the formal world, and I've experienced some things myself. Like I was telling you earlier on, and I was in UJ, yeah. like I was saying, I mean, Standard Bank, didn't, I didn't get a job with Standard Bank. No one intended I was the best no. today, me and my class, but yeah. remember in that time, I mean, the, the rule was you work hard, you get rewards from it. Sure. But I didn't know you work hard, if you're a foreigner, you don't get reward for it, yeah, I, so I guess. Came with T's and C's. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Sure. I didn't know those T's and sure. C's. So I applied for the internship. The weirdest part is I didn't. I didn't get into the internship, but DV Design, the company I own, makes seventy bags for the interns. Oh wow! And I was sitting in the room, or with the interns, and I was like a special guest, mm -hmm. but I was not part of the internship. Sure. I did, clearly was not qualified enough. Oh, wow. After that, starting back sponsor my honors to get a formal job. I was declined mm -hmm. and what I didn't really like was I was given a generic response mm. and that make you question yourself as a young person am mm. I not good enough why mm. are these people not taking me I thought yeah. I worked hard mm. you know mentally it disturbed me I I went into a phase of depression a bit because I'm thinking oh, wow. I thought I was I'm doing all my best yeah. to be able to get you know get a, a job in standard bank that was my dream job mm. I, I loved it but I'm being rejected on no account mm. I thought I mean I, I finished best yeah. I mean <laughs> what else sure, sure. <laughs> is required yeah. you know that was my first experience the same time i was in uj i was a senior tutor and i i was the best student in that all my lecturers knew me i i formed a relationship with them so there was a there's a post after the senior tutor you have the academic clerk the academic clerk is like the boss of the tutors okay more or less for a specific model so for my course before me and after me i'm sure every senior tutor became the academic clerk, especially if you were good at your job, which I, I think I was. So I applied for this thing, I went from the interview, my interview was like a conversation because everyone on the interview knew me and I knew them, you know, every single person in my class, I know that job is for Davis, you know. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get that job. <laughs> <laughs> to my sure. surprise, they picked all the people and they sent me this email that I, I read and read. I cried that day because I'm like, what am I going to do next year? Wow. This was what I was holding on. Stellenberg already rejected me. This night rejected me. Yeah. I mean, I thought I worked so hard. It, it, it didn't feel good to be the best student anymore because mm -hmm. I wasn't looking forward to anything. Yeah. But okay, you know what? I'm, now I'm doing my master's, right? Okay. I'm going to be doing my master's. I was a normal tutor. It got to a point where the people I tutored were my colleague, my classmate, were my boss. Okay. Which was a very bad experience for me because I saw how people were yeah, as well, yeah. political wise. Because I would try to get for help, you know. Can I make it? Can I make it? You know, to try to make money. I'm trying to. I was getting three thousand. Oh wow. A month. Um, I was staying at home for a while. I decided to move out with three thousand. So to 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 subscribe to ten, I started tutoring. I would tutor from eight to six. Oh wow. Back any a, any breaks in between? Maybe an hour. Yeah. To drink water, to eat. Maybe. Monday to Friday or seven Monday. days a week? When I'm not tutoring at UG, I'm doing my private tutoring. Over the weekends? Monday to Sunday. <laughs> I was, okay. I was, yeah. I was working at the same time. I was trying to do account at the same time I was doing my master's. Wow. I, would, I had class 8 to 5 and I'd get assignment every week mm. and I was trying to juggle this. And within that space, you know, lecturers were seeing me. I think the part that got to me was when 
During that period, a position, and they needed a third academic thing in. Apparently, they caught everyone in my class. Mm -hmm. Most of them said they got a job. They appointed a guy who had a sub. As at the point, time he was appointed, he hadn't passed his sub. Mm -hmm. But he was appointed to be my boss at that point. And I was South the African. best student. South South African. African. Okay. I was the best student then and I'm thinking, my name is still there in the world yeah. at UJ. If yeah. you go to the department, my lecturers know me. I'm doing my masters. Sure. But I'm a normal tutor getting three thousand. Oh wow. That went by the year. I mean I I I but but, but the, the, the tutoring, did that give you any kind of comfort and, and motivation to just keep going? Because you're saying you're hitting this academic wall. You're saying, <laughs> it, you know, you're getting the qualifications, honors, masters, um, you're achieving, you're top of your class, but you, you're not really seeing upward mobility on the employment the side. Yeah. On the I'm employment right. side, you know, you're not you seeing know, the upward mobility, there's not money coming in, but at least from the tutoring side, did that bring you... I the, enjoy the, the I love, I love tutoring. Yeah. So, I was really good at it. So, mm -hmm. privately, I was able to, like, be able to multiply my, my, my income. Yeah. To the point I could cover my salary and have enough to come to school, buy groceries and all of that. I'm a hustler. I, I would like to believe that because sure. I would, you know, I started doing accounting work. I would literally take any job I feel like I can do. Yeah. Even if I don't really know how to do it, then go learn how to do it yeah. to get it done. And we got two projects from UJ as TV design as my business. Two projects. We made a hundred back for UJ within that year for the international. While I was a normal tutor, I would sit with the, the senior manager of the international office. Oh, wow. I would sit with all the people there but in my department I wasn't recognized mm -hmm. I will make but I make bags within the department even so wait before you go to bags what bags and then and, and, and no. what is DV design let's let's talk about that uh, so DV design is my life for work, even, yeah. I may say. DV Design started in 2017, mm -hmm. officially, but it's an idea that came to mind in 2015, 2016. Okay. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur from my first year, and so I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? I would always like think. Then I remember my mom, stepmom used to sell African print. Oh, wow. And I was being forced to be in the shop. Yeah. Not an experience, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Sure. When I got to my great job, I even said, I'm not going anymore. But I've also noticed then that when I needed something to be made, I made my graduation stuff. Okay. I would go to a tailor like, this is what I want. Yeah. And they will make it for it. So I've always been someone who really like fashion yeah. outside. But you know, in Nigeria, you can't really express yourself like that much because you need to focus on school. So I didn't really, that part of mine was really dormant. Then in 2016, with starting back always have this program where they bring the bursary student and like there'll be a guest speaker. The guest speaker was Sia, the traded man. I don't okay. know if you know of him. No, no, no. Uh, he made it to the under 25, 25, then Forbes for 20, I think 2019 or 2018. So he came and he gave a talk on how he started the traded man. It was just some boy from I think the Northern K. He came to Joburg at 18, 19, oh, wow. and he made it. That's why I said we need a lot of people that look like you on TV because mm -hmm. hearing him speak made me feel like okay, this guy I even have a degree. I'm mm -hmm. about to get a degree. This guy didn't have anything and he was able to get this far. Mm -hmm. What's stopping me? Sure. Then there was this lovely woman, Mrs. Susan. Mm -hmm. She didn't know what she did. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Susan was just on my case. I need to meet uh, see ya. I'm someone I don't like attaching myself. If you give your talk good, I enjoy it, but I won't come talk to you because I don't like being a groupie. Mm -hmm. So no, you need to speak to Sia, I need to speak to Sia. I spoke to Sia like every other person I was there that day. But he left one thing in my mind, you can do it. Then I spoke to my best friend, Nicholas, who became the co-founder of DV. Called him in December 2016, because I always do this reflection in 2016. Sure. Where's my life going? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do next year and all of that, except from school. So I told him, you know what, I think I have this idea. We search online, like, they make bags through the fabrics. Do they wait on the bag? You know, how does, yeah. how does it work? <laughs> You know, we started doing the curiosity day. My mom also was interested in that. Because mm -hmm. she, my, my mom now, speaking of my mom now, my mom I stayed with really, her. She also saw the fabric. She saw how life works. My stepmom saw the fabric. She was also selling the fabric. Sure. So we also discussed that and everything. Then she found a tailor by Jamieston. Then I decided, I decided in, 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 in March, when I started school, I get bursary money, I get money for test book. I don't, I don't, I don't buy test books. Sure. <laughs> so normally I would use that money to buy laptops or use it to just buy clothes or whatever. So I decided to make my first investment. So it was like three grand. So I went to go see this tailor in Jimmy Stain and use all my 3,000 to me. Our first bags. Okay. You know, my partner then said he wasn't ready, he doesn't have, I said me, I'm ready. And I, I just believe in her, let's just do it. I wanted to see, would it work? 
I mean, it doesn't matter. We made this bag. They weren't the best. I still have one at home. Got mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. Some people thought it was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Some people thought they were bad. Some Always people insulted like that. me. Yeah. I mean, three or four people liked it. I'm like, okay, if they like it, I'm sure there are more people like this in this world. Exactly. And I like it. <laughs> you yeah. know what? Yeah. I like it and I feel like I have good taste. And mm -hmm. if I feel like I like it, then, you know. The people in my where I stayed then, they had mixed emotion. I could see it in their face. What's yeah. this boy trying to do? Yeah. But you don't know me, so that's fine. Exactly. So we, we started DV then. It was a, a side business. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a side business until 2018. We're chilling. Out, so I told Miss, Mrs. Susan that, okay, I've started this business. I showed her some of the things we do. I will literally, then I was in my honors. I will go to Jimmy Stain. I will study on the road. I will study while I'm in Jimmy Stain mm -hmm. to go fetch orders. She would disappoint me. I will fight with her and everything. I was still learning business then. I will literally be. Going. I'll come back late at night, um, even if I'm writing on a Monday. I'll be in Jimmy's Day until 7, 8 wow. at night. Then she called me, I was studying. I was, we had a group assignment, and Mrs. Susan called me that they're about to do this internship and they want us to make 70 bucks. Can we do it? Wow. Of course we can. I mean, at that point, <laughs> I didn't know how we we're gonna do it. That gave me the best and the worst experience we've ever had. Mm -hmm. So we spoke to this lady. Okay, we get in seventy bags. She make it feel like it's nothing. Now, I know we'll finish on we'll finish on time. We had a lot of delays for the because we used to get our fabric from Nigeria. Then we didn't get on time. This woman was so unprofessional. She didn't start the work on time. I remember the day I was I was I was home. Then my partner called me that, hey, dude, come, like, nothing has been done. And I think it was one week to deliver. We had to go there with Ford and everything. We did not sleep the night we had to deliver. Oh. We had to punch out. I slept one hour. My partner didn't sleep at all. Nick didn't sleep. We had to punch out all the bags. We had to make sure everything we think, and we cannot mess up this, yeah. this, this, this deal. We didn't make any profit from that work because a lot of things arise that we never planned for yeah. and all of that. I, had to, I didn't bath, I didn't brush my teeth, <laughs> I didn't sleep, I had to go all the way to Standard Bank, Rose Bank, but I think it was by the, some, the main one, but I think by Santin, I think. I was sitting by the reception mm -hmm. with these bags, dirty, tired. That's when Kelly came. Mm -hmm. She was the first person who saw me, and she didn't know what she did that day, because mm -hmm. I was down. Yeah. I was really down, and her friend came. I was like, "This bag is so nice. Whatever you do, we'll make it." You know, she picked so much interest, and I immediately I had to lighten up because I already had a dark morning. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. thinking, "Oh, this is not really gonna work." I'm tired. I'm sitting in that reception, thinking, "Sure, I wish we never even got this project <laughs> <laughs> in the in the first place." Sure. And she came, and she she lightened my mood. And mm -hmm. I think that was our first Encounter. encounter. I never thought I was even gonna see her after that. Yeah. To be sincere. And she just picked interest. Mm -hmm. You know, she then the day of the, the gifting, she was there, we got to talk more and everything. We exchanged numbers and she, she took the bag. After a while we didn't hear from each other. Then she I think she contacted me after. No, like the bags are really nice, they're really strong and all of that. Then that's how we started building the, the, the relationship. Then I don't know what she said she's a model and everything she like to at that then I don't think we even had really big plans of doing photo shoots and all of those stuff. Sure. That was when it started. Then she did the, the First photo shoot we had was not even with that was with <laughs> it was so <laughs> whack. <laughs> I remember I, I called a couple of my friends, gave them bags, we went to this other top roof and just shot some pictures and just it was so <laughs> it was so rubbish. But you know, it's when I see some of the pictures it's good to reflect and so yeah. wow, wow. You have to start something. You know, then my as at this point my parents were still thinking it was a side business, but I remember my graduation, my mom told me something. We were sitting by the stairs. And she told me about how she perceived DV. Mm -hmm. And that changed a lot. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I thought that now I have my family back in, which mm -hmm. is really important. True. You know, because then now when I'm deciding the next year, what am I going to do? Because now I'm unemployed. Mm -hmm. I work at UG, I'm getting 3000 mm -hmm. But this is a business I really love. Yeah. There's no money. Mm. But I told her, like, mommy, I don't know. This is what I really want to do. And sure. she gave me the support, you know, go for it, do it. Yeah. So I will continuously do it. Then April 2019, I made a decision. I'm at 3000 that, you know, I'm moving out. Sure. My mom wasn't angry with it. But I saw for what I'm trying to do, I need to learn who I am mm -hmm. as a person. So I, I called Chris, my one of my best friends, like, dude, he was also in a same position, dude, let's move out. He agreed. I didn't know I'm going to finance the moving out, sure. to be sincere. <laughs> because my salary was three grand, yeah. and if, uh, our rent was 2.5. Mm -hmm. So after I paid 2.5, I got one grand, groceries. But I'm like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it work. Sure. And God exists. And every time that happens, I'll always, I'll always get opportunities that mm. come my way. 
through my skills because I'm I always make sure I told my mom that I'm going out there and I'm gonna lock, knock on multiple doors. I'm gonna like try 50 things. Sure. I just need one thing to work. Sure. And I'm sure like I you know what if it's just God just looking at my effort, you know what this boy have done too much. You know wow. what? Let me just wow. you know, but I had that in me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But it's just I have something pushing me, you know, go out there. And, and and then the designs that you you or the patterns that you use. What is that inspired by? Because there's a sort of standard motif you use on your your, your aprons, you've got mm. bags, mm -hmm. uh, you've got backpacks, you've got all kinds of things, but the motif is the same, it's identifiable, mm -hmm. um, you've you've got that embossing going on now. Mm -hmm. Um any inspiration? And, and, and where where did it come from? The main inspiration was on how we can normalize African design into our daily lives. Yeah. What I didn't like was when we started until now is that everyone calls it African print. Mm. Firstly, those things are not making Africa, they're making Malaysia. Mm. They're nowhere close to African print. Mm. And I've never seen Europeans wear suits. I've never seen this thing being called an European suit. Yeah. It's called a, a suit. suit. Mm. Right, so that was the, 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 the motive behind that we need to find a way to normalize those bags Though they've been to an African print, we're gonna ride on that wave sure. But the end goal is to normalize I won't give you, I won't give out our, our future plan Sure This is just a tip <laughs> <laughs> of the iceberg mm -hmm. I always have a 10 year plan, mm -hmm. whatever I'm gonna do Sure I won't go into anything without having a 10 year plan Because it's not worth my time Because I never want to do things short a while so to answer your question about the fabric the aim was always to find fabrics that you cannot see everywhere sure that is a bit unique and still settled to fit into contemporary day-to-day -day life where i don't i stand out but i'm not i would i, would, I don't want to say obvious yeah. when you see the bag you see it stands out but it complements whatever you're wearing sure it doesn't be like it's the only thing you see when sure. you see me sure you get what I'm saying? That was the whole aim to find colors that people will appreciate mm -hmm. and will show the evolution of Africa as well. And which is still our aim in David Design that over time we need to be able to make bags that to the point that they called bags sure. but made in Africa. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. Not by African made, made in African by African. Sure. Not African print. Mm -hmm. And because we, we have a goal to be able to make our own print as we go, that's that, that's the main aim. And create more exclusive bags based on the print we we'll create. But what we're doing now is finding historical meanings to to what we do. Because if you go on our website, which I wish I could show, you'll see every bag we make has a name. And every of them has a meaning behind it. One of the bags was called Indigo. It's a backpack. It was based on um, this song by Erica Badu. Yes. It's called The Ela. Uh -huh. Right. And she says something, they call you Africa, but we we call you indigo but they call you african mm -hmm. and i was up on uh, that night i'm like okay what does she mean then i went to the internet and i researched more about indigo i found out that indigo is the longest thread in the history of fashion mm. and this was found in africa and was mined by africa african slave mm. creating indigo to ship or do it to europe mm -hmm. so it's our thing yeah it, we, it's our thing sure you know that's why i gave that name that bag that name is to represent all the hard work our mothers, our fathers had to do that we're not recognizing the fashion in your Louis Vuittons today, in your Gucci today, Dior, no. your Dior, all of that, all of that, that, that part mm -hmm. played a big role in the fashion in Africa and in, in the world. Yeah. And Africa has been excluded when it comes to fashion. Yeah. It's like we look up to the Europeans to detect mm -hmm. our fashion taste. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why we want to create DV design. And DV design is not just gonna be about bags alone. This is the starting point. Sure. But we wanted something that will build our brand that will become recognized. So when we start releasing clothing, accessories and everything else, it would start making sense. And there's DV design and there's something we also created. If you check our website it's called dv store mm -hmm. not dv design yeah and that's because we also want to curate other people's things as time goes on it's a platform we're trying to create a platform where you find african fashion mm -hmm. we want to be one of the people who send trends okay african trends when you come i mean europeans showcase their things mm -hmm. asians showcase their lifestyle we can learn from them i'm always open to learning i mean i'm just this is not african dress but things have changed mm -hmm. but they've involved their fashion mm -hmm. we also need to show the evolution of our fashion mm -hmm. through what we've learned to them but adapt it into our own thing context as well. into our own context yeah. as well which is the hem that's why when we make the bags we put it in a day that i don't want to make a bag that 
you just drop in your wardrobe mm -hmm. and want a bag that's also going to be functional for you that you can use on a daily daily basis mm -hmm. that is durable as well yeah. so 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 tell me how did you then get the skill because there's a design skill that goes into this <laughs> then there's the functionality of the bag as well mm. there had to be some time and effort put into that that was not at the core of your studies it wasn't i don't yeah. know that. You know, I found myself in DB Design. I yeah. found that I actually love fashion more than I love accounting. Mm -hmm. I actually do plan to go to a fashion school in France, in Paris, wow. in the next five to seven years. Wow. It's something I have I have to do. The design came naturally. Mm -hmm. Like I'm someone who, I've always liked exclusivity. Like I told you, even when I need to sew something, I would. Even people used to compliment my style a lot when I was in varsity and I was broke. Mm -hmm. I would wear shoes, I would wear, but I could put it together. Okay. You know, when you say, okay, this boy is broke, but you know what? He managed it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes drip, it drip drip is yeah. drip, drip, yeah. transcends. You, you don't yeah. need a lot of money to drip. Mm. Mm. You, you, mm. you really didn't need it. So when we started making, when we started making bags, I have to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. I had to watch a lot of, I started following Louis Vuitton a lot. Mm -hmm. I had to read up on all their history. I had to read up on Gucci. I had to read up on Dion. I had to read up on Adidas. I had to read up on Nike. Because I'm trying to understand how do you create a product and how do you create branding mm -hmm. at the same time. So I did a lot of crazy research. I spent midnight mm -hmm. when I'm not studying to like read Wikipedias, to mm -hmm. read histories and all of that. And mm -hmm. that opened my mind that, okay, these people, it gave me a thing that like they, they, they all started from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Louis Vuitton was making luggage bags for for the royals that sure. the aim was not to create a brand sure it was later on that that came so i saw okay what can we we do for now okay backpacks mm -hmm. the thing about bags is you're not making a new bag it's not possible mm -hmm. you can't make it an entire new bag mm -hmm. what you can do is innovate yes. on the bag yes. so every time i see a bag is my thinking is always how can i innovate to my ideas into this bag that when you see it if i showed you what initially started this and the final product, you won't really see it. Yeah. I'm not, I will see that this is what we copied to make this. Sure, sure. To make it, which is what I'm saying, making it our own. Sure. Because I've seen it, okay, I look at Louis Vuitton's bag, I look at all of that. I mean, we're not at that level yet because of the machineries and all of that. But what can we do now? Mm. Davies, I'm, I'm very inspired by not only your hustle, I, I'm a hustler myself. But, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I've seen from a lot of Nigerians and other Zimbabweans, the work ethic um, that, and, and this is again in the context that I relate to mm. foreigners, has been exceptionally high, has been inspiring. You know, we, we touched on unemployment in this country and you mentioned that you feel there's more the youth can do. Uh, you I feel mean, that they... they, they they, they, they're not really putting themselves out there. They're not fighting hard enough. But what do you think can be done by youth in South Africa? I'll give you an example that I gave. Now, let me say that about job seeking. When I was trying to get a job, I, uh, I thought, okay, I have done a lot. Then a friend told me, she sent me a 20 list of recruiters that she emailed hmm. when she was looking for a job. Where, where is she from? She's, she is South African, but she's Mozambican originally. Okay. She's okay. first generation South African, okay. if that makes sense. Okay. So her parents were originally from Mozambique, and then she was, girl, but she has that Mozambique background still. She's, she, she knows how to speak Portuguese. She's in tune with her, with her descendant. So she told me she had to email 20 recruiters. That's excluding all the applications she did. Sure. She told me how to actively look for work. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking that, how many of the youth have done that? Mm. Like, if you tell me you're looking for a job, my first question, I've, how many people did you email? Yeah. How many people did you actively tell that I'm looking for a job? Because sure. what I would do when I'm doing my hustle is tutoring. Literally, there was a time in DB career where every time I'm in the mega bus, I'm in a taxi, anyone who's sitting next to me, I would tell you about DV. Mm, sure. I would, I, would, <laughs> I would tell you about you eat DV. and sleep and... <laughs> I, that was my aim and sure. that's what we need we need active doers mm. in, in the society mm. i told someone something they said that my aim this is to actively do whatever i'm gonna do if i say i'm gonna go get sugar by 2 p.m <laughs> by 2 p.m i must by 150 i must be being on my way to go get sugar sure if i say i'm waking up in the morning mm -hmm. and i'm going to town mm -hmm. by one morning and i've been doing that the, yeah. let me tell you what i've done today before i, <laughs> I got here this morning i i'm a tutor as well mm -hmm. right I had a session by morning side mm -hmm. in Santin. In Santin, yeah. I don't have a car. Yeah. I use taxis and Ubers mm -hmm. when I can afford it. This morning I went through town. 
before I went to Morningside because there's a print I'm working on, on for myself, a jersey I wanted to print it on. I had to leave early by 7, go to us town, give the guy what I need to do, go all the way to Santin, to tell the guy, leave, go to Rambeck to meet so we could come here. Hmm. How many people are willing to do that? Sure. They already complain about the distance. Sure. I walk in town. Sure. You can't walk with me in town. Yeah. I will lose you. <laughs> <laughs> I will lose you because I'm willing to walk two hours in town mm -hmm. to make sure I get all the materials needed. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to come back if I forget anything. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to walk from MTN all the way to, uh, what do you call it, to Bram. Sure. If I have to. Sure. We need more of that. And this is when you can do that. So what can we do as as we the youngest we've got the youngest population in Africa I think globally that's speaking gold. you say that's gold and and we're sitting with a problem and it's mm. something that I told you is 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 one that's political it's that a lot of people have complained that people in leadership positions are old they're out of touch with ideas they're out of touch with the way or where the world is going what's the solution because I've I've sat with Kenyans I've sat with Nigerians it's it's the same song, but how do we how do we practically make this thing work? It's to it's to teach people that no one is coming to save you. Mm -hmm. If you're still talking about government, talking about mm -hmm. all of it, it's still <laughs> telling them that you know what, if the government acts right, you will be saved. Yeah. The reality is the government is not acting right. Sure. We need to let people understand their rea rea reality and know what could be. Mm -hmm. What could be is the government could be nice and the world would be a better place. Yeah. Mm, that won't happen. Yeah. And that's what I realized. That's why I'm willing to be able to do what I'm telling you I do. Sure. If we have more youth doing what I do actively, mm -hmm. I end up, I make a living. Mm -hmm. I don't have a formal job. Mm -hmm. But it got to a point people had formal job borrow money from me. Mm. I don't have a formal job. The fact that it's a capitalism system mm -hmm. shows you that if you work, I mean, you might not get what you desire, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But you will get something. Sure. People need to understand, okay, what is my situation? I'm in Tembisa and this is it. But with my constraint, what can I do? Mm. Right now, what can I keep actively do every day? Don't you also think people need to look at finances and value differently? Because there is still a thing called bartering. Bartering is not illegal. Mm -hmm. I can exchange my services. You could maybe say, okay, uh, PJ, there's a service that I want. Could you maybe evaluate this diamond for me? And I say, okay, but can you maybe give me about 10 DB design bags? Um, I'd like to sell them in a certain market. Like no money has has, has well, exchanged, value but value has exchanged. Shouldn't we then, hmm. shouldn't our people across Africa financially struggling maybe look at that as the new, new way, way of doing things? Yeah. I do, I to be able to, to, to reach to the reach level that. where you can start having cash flow more regularly to do the things you want to do. Yeah, yes, yes. I definitely agree. And that's a long, that's a good long term, which brings me to the point of, that's why what we're doing is really, really important and conversations like this, because we need to teach people how to be long-sighted mm -hmm. and not short-sighted. Mm -hmm. We need to create more thinkers mm -hmm. and doers, sure. not people who just want to be fed. Because mm -hmm. what we're saying now, we can say it, but like actively doing, after this, will someone actively go say you know what davis i know you do this and i need this from you can you exchange yeah. that you yeah. know that's what we need mm -hmm. if we can actively create active thinking there's going to be a lot of new ways to think sure new ways to develop things mm. which is what we need now we need innovators mm. that look at us out of the box regardless what my situation is mm. how can i make it work because that's always my my MO like okay what are my constraints okay I can get a permit I can do this I can do this but no one is stopping me from tutoring anyone mm. no one is stopping me from getting accounting service from anyone I became a qualified management accountant with SEMA wow. I flooded the wow. system I won't even lie to you <laughs> <laughs> so, I flooded the system awesome for you to be able to become a qualified ACMA and CGMA, you need three years experience, mm -hmm. right? Firstly, okay, I won't lie, my education have boosted me because I got a, I got an exemption to the final exam. Mm -hmm. So instead of seven board exam, I only wrote the one board exam. A lot of people used to complain, I don't have experience, I don't have experience, but they don't know what I actively do. Mm. I've been, I've, over the time I've done, over this time, 34 years, I've done 40 financial statements. 
Wow. I've handled almost 10 clients mm -hmm. by myself, mm -hmm. by actively just asking people. Mm -hmm. You know, I started by offering my service for a thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do your accounting, your books on a monthly basis, pay me 1,000 retainers. Mm -hmm. I will offer my service cheaply, mm -hmm. you know, pay me 500, I'll do this for you. I'll do, but one thing I always make sure during that period is I, I deliver. Mm -hmm. As I was building that career, I saw, okay, I need to go to the next stage. What do I need? I need my qualification. The exam cost me 15,000. I, I didn't look like the guy who could. When I was Selling people 15, yeah, I mean, like 200 rand or 400 rand in my account. Yeah. I, was, I had this dream of then I had the exam, man. I brought in a lot of money mm. and asked for a lot of help. Mm. I had people who gave me a thousand, I had people who gave me two thousand because of what I've done for them in the past because oh, I would wow. just offer you my service. Oh, wow. You know, I had people, five thousand were gifts out mm. of the 15. Mm. The rest was borrowed, the rest I paid myself. Mm. So I managed to raise this 15,000. But looking at the constraint I had in raising the 15,000, I couldn't fail that exam. Mm. It became a must pass. Yeah. I had to pass that exam. Exactly. There was too much at stake. At stake. I, but at the same time, I need to continue living my life. Because mm -hmm. now I need to raise money to go pay the people I owe now mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I had to find a way to juggle. So I wrote this exam. My God's grace, I passed it. Congrats. And for you to, to, to become a qualified thing, you need to now write. There's something we call a SEMA write up. Mm -hmm. So I noticed in the SEMA write up what these people want to see is. Can you do the work? Mm -hmm. Not if you work in standing back. Not yeah. if you work anywhere. Do you have the experience? Can you actively do the do work? The work? Yeah. So I use my company, DV Design, mm -hmm. that I'm an employee mm -hmm. in DV Design. Mm -hmm. And I do the accounting, which is true, mm -hmm. which I do. And I did my write up. It was a five page write up. Mm -hmm. And I read it. And of course, if you read the write up, and so, this boy, regardless where he is working, he can do the work. Mm -hmm. And that's what people really care about at the end of the day. So it's not you fraud, know? really, but I mean, it's uh, yeah, I mean, you, 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 <laughs> used, you used your own company as an active case. So uh, uh, it's not really that. But I mean, you you you, you are just thinking outside, outside of, the, of the box, using what you have available at the time. That's, that's brought me to this point where it now made me believe one thing, which is one thing I also want to take forward to the generation. My aim is not to to be selfish with what I've, what I've achieved, is to be able to, I, I want to see more people like myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I'm not a millionaire, I'm yeah. nothing, but yet. I know, yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. I know I can create value. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We need people that see themselves too. You know, Kendrick said one thing in the new track he released that you can, you can only help others after you help yourself. Mm. Which is true, right. from Which a full true. cup. You know? You can only pour from, from a full from cup. Full cup yeah. you know? That's why I'm trying to help myself, so yeah. I can help other people. But now, if we find other people helping themselves, mm -hmm. that's how we're going to come. And I told someone, if I do a child development and I touch one million kids in Africa, I've touched a billion people in the future. Yeah, because each person knows at least a thousand They have a generation, people. they know a thousand people. And those thousand at least know a thousand. And, and they're all going to have kids. Sure, sure. And that's how, that's how we must spread the influence. We need to spread the love amongst the youth that it's okay to be cool. Mm. The idea of being cool is not just going to parties, it's not anything. You can go to Clubbing, parties, you know. Drinking. Drinking. No, it's cool mm. in that moment, but your future is cooler. Mm. You being able to think is more cool sure. than that alcohol. And the moment we can do this, which we, we've agreed that we're going to continue spreading, yeah. we'll be able to touch more lives. We'll, you know, the aim at this point for me is to be able to increase the average in the black community. Mm. I need to be able to have a conversation with a black, an average black man and not feel like I'm too intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know, where I feel like I can learn from this person, from mm. what they know, they can communicate. Mm. And the only way we can do is if we actively educate. The help, the people who are in better position needs to educate the ones that are not. Sure. I'm not talking about, about money now, I'm mm -hmm. talking about information, mm -hmm. I'm talking about knowledge. Which is why we created the the, 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 the platform Affluence Hub to mm -hmm. be able to spread that so we can empower each other and move forward. Davies, I think we leave it at that. <laughs> thank you for your time. We could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> uh, but just to say thank you for your time. Um, you know, it, it's been insightful. It's nice to know more of you, thank you. in this light as well. Mm. Um, there's a lot of passionate comments and remarks we also shared before you know, going, going on camera. And I think I'm, I'm really excited about being, being in Africa, being a young person, just being alive. I know there's a lot of negativity 
going going around and spreading around in the world but there's a whole host of good things and there's opportunities opportunities and i believe people like us giving each other platforms giving each other time mm. um like i said earlier on a candle lighting you know another one is is there's no loss of flame you mm. understand there's no loss of flame so just thank you once again uh, keep doing the great work you are doing and i want to possibly collaborate with you from a diamond side Now we've had this we've had this conversation yeah, before. I didn't forget. <laughs> so um, I, I think I would rather than work with guys like yourself that are that are up and coming, mm -hmm. because maybe certain more established brands believe that they want to continue carrying out a certain image. Mm -hmm. But it's nice when we at this up and coming phase and putting each other on mm -hmm. um, that we we just experience the beauty of each other's growth mm -hmm. and just how many opportunities come out of this True. you know True. um divergent you know sort of opportunities so thank you once again and thank you to everyone who's viewed this who's liked who subscribed who shared enjoy the love let's keep supporting each other short sure. cheers